Welcome to Getaway Day, episode 49. I'm Gautam, joined by Mason, and the lockout is over. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know that. And last week, since the lockout ended last Thursday, um, Major League Baseball has been in a frenzy of transactions, um, players reporting, finding out about injuries. Uh, Isaiah Isaiah Kiner-Falefa has been on 20% of the teams in the American League. It is a wild situation, and we are going to get into a little bit of the CBA talk, and then we're going to go through a ton of uh, major transactions that have happened across the league uh, in the past uh, week. So uh, uh, before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and YouTube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Make sure you let us know your thoughts through the YouTube comments, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, or hit us up on Twitter and Facebook at Getaway Day Pod. How are you doing, Mason? I am doing absolutely fantastic. Baseball is back, and I could not be happier. I've got tickets to opening day in St. Louis. We've got our baseball trip booked for the year. I am just looking forward to enjoying basically the whole summer. The only thing yeah. I haven't done yet is renewed my MLB TV subscription. Uh, I canceled that out of frustration and I haven't got it back yet because I'm kind of tempted to not until they figure out something with blackouts, but they're not going to do that. So, Well, yeah, I get, I think all baseball fans are kind of like on cloud nine right now. And this, uh, this last week has just been just overload of uh, baseball things. Um, I definitely wouldn't want another off season like this one, but it's been kind of fun at the same time. Yeah, it was absolute hell for uh, 99 days. Um, it got to the point where you and I both didn't really want to talk about baseball anymore. Like it just yeah, got we so, so frustrating, frustrating and tired and, and then all of a sudden in the span of like four hours, I was sitting there watching Twitter and it started looking like something was actually going to happen, which is like the fourth time that had happened that week. And then it did happen. And it was like an instant uh, flip of a switch for me. Like it went from, I don't want to talk about baseball to, I don't want to shut up. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's hit on some of the highlights of the CBA or uh, yeah, the CBA that was agreed upon finally between the players and the owners. So, um, Big one is the minimum salary, which uh, increased to $720,000 uh, for 2022, and it will increase by 20000 each year of the five-year CBA. Oops. Uh, there's was also increases. Supposed to say, 000. yeah, my bad. Uh, and then also split contracts are higher, and first-time 40-man uh, members will also receive higher salaries than in the past. Um the competitive balance tax first threshold is 230 million starting in 2022. Uh, it'll progressively get higher each year. The CBA up to 244 in 2026. Um, there's a extra additional um, threshold of the competitive balance tax, which people are calling the Cohen tax, which is what 60 million above the first threshold yes so this year 290 million dollars and you hit the cohen tax and uh surprise surprise the first owner to ever eclipse that threshold is the guy they named it after um steve cohen i think currently is up at like 300 mil yep um yeah so that was obviously one of the biggest struggles of this negotiating period it is good that they were able to raise it. Maybe not exactly what they were looking for, but um, it's still sort of going to be uh, that hard cap that most teams, the wide majority of teams are not going to be passing. Yeah. Um, moving on to the so, bonus pool for yeah. pre-arbitration players. Yeah, so the bonus pool for pre-arb uh, ended up being $50 million in total. And that $50 million is going to be split between uh, basically any pre-arbitration player who uh, gets an award. Um, so um, 
top five uh, in Cy Young MVP, get some money. Uh, it's different based on uh, which uh, which place you get in that. Um, rookie of the years uh, get some extra money if you're all MLB first team or second team. Um, and then the uh, rest of the money is then distributed amongst the top 100 pre-arbitration uh, players according to a war calculation that the uh, league and the players uh, have to agree to no later than July 1st of this year. Um, then every year after that, if there's any changes to that, it has to be by opening day. Um, and so you're going to see roughly a hundred and maybe 110 guys get bonuses each year. Um, so that is a, a huge step forward for the players. Um, and then after we get past money, then we start seeing some things that are going to affect, uh, the draft and with the draft, we now have a draft lottery uh, in Major League Baseball, and it is for the top six picks in uh, the uh, June um, amateur draft. Uh, if you receive revenue sharing, you cannot get a lottery pick three years in a row. If you pay into revenue sharing, you can't get a lottery pick two years in a row. And the odds are um, pretty pretty even honestly for about the first uh the first seven teams um so the um three worst teams 16 and a half percent odds and then it decreases down to about uh one percent by the time you get out of the the bottom 10 um but the 18 teams that are not in um the uh playoffs all have a shot with the 18th team like that first team out of the playoffs having a 0.23 percent chance of getting the number one pick which is awesome i'm is so excited to see that happen for the first time my question with the draft lottery is and we probably won't know the results of it for a few years whether it's actually doing the intended thing where teams will be less likely to want to just tank i i'm not really sure that this is necessarily going to do it because what's re what's the real difference between picking first and sixth? It's it's not like football. Well, it, first and tenth, really, even because like yeah. um, if you if you basically um, reach that revenue sharing, payers can't get a lottery pick two years in a row. They can't pick higher than tenth if if they got one the year before. Uh, and if you receive revenue sharing, you can't pick higher than 10th if you've received two in a row. So, like, there's not really a whole lot of deterrence there. Now, if there's, like, an obvious uh, choice for, like, the number one, like Adley, if you, if you know that Adley is available in that draft, like, you aren't guaranteed to get him. And so at that point, maybe you don't tank as hard. I don't know. Like, I see it as a not tanking as hard measure, not a stop tanking measure. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, are, the, are the Orioles really going to just try really hard to win just because of this? I, I would not say yes to that. Well, I mean it's been confirmed that they offered a 10 year, $300 million plus contract to a particular free agent. We'll talk about here in a bit. They did. Yeah. Who are we talking about? Correa. Really? Yeah. And it's Dang. been, and it's been on the table for a long time. Huh. Well, yeah, they're going to have to do a little bit more than that to, uh, get him get to come him there. Come there. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about the Chris Bryant situation in a little bit, but, uh, the one thing that's, I guess, more impactful to what we'll actually see on the field in 2022 um, are the expanded playoffs, where we will have 12 teams in the playoffs instead of 10 for the first time. Um, it'll be the three division winners and then three wild cards in each league. The top two division winners will get a bye, and then the um, remaining four teams will play in a, in a wild card series, which is a best of three at the um, higher seeded teams uh, ballpark. 
and the winners of those two uh, wildcard series will move on to the typical uh, division series that we've had in the past. So it'll just become the, the playoff that we've seen in the past for the rounds after the wildcard round, basically. Yeah, it, the one game playoff is gone. Yeah, and they will not reseed between. So um, if the uh, three seed and the five seed win, the uh, number one seed's still going to play the number three. So, oh, okay. um, cause it's that number one seed against the winner of three and six. And then the number two seed against the winner of four and five. Um, so that'll be, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, the, the one thing I can't remember, they haven't extended the calendar for the playoffs, right? They've compressed everything to fit the extra two games in, right? I believe so. I think there may be a couple off days that are removed from the, from the playoff schedule. Okay. The, the in between series off days. Yeah. And yeah. that wildcard series is really not going to take too long. Cause it's just going to, it should just finish up in three days or, or less. Yeah. And since they don't have a, a travel day, um, that they have to do in that series since they're staying at home of the, uh, the higher seed. Yep. So that will be nice. What do you think about 12 team playoff? Like, I hate I, it. I'm okay with it, but like, it's definitely better than 14. It's better than 14, but I mean, it's still not good. I we had a system that I I really really liked. It allowed there to be a Cinderella story, but it didn't make the Cinderella story a guarantee. Almost like right. the more teams you get, the more it starts turning into the NCAA tournament. And like the NCAA say, tournament, I was going to say the the better comp is the NBA season, which is eighty two games long, but it's basically just a glorified seeding process. When more than half the teams in the league make the playoffs, it's like, why are we playing such a long season in baseball if it's just for seeding? If so many teams are going to make it, yeah. Well, and and the reason I compared it to the the uh, March Madness tournament is just the more teams you get the more chances to have a UMBC come out and beat number one, Virginia. Um, we we've already been kind of, or some fans have been upset whenever you see the two best teams in, in the league, not make the world series last year and the Dodgers and giants. And in that series itself was amazing, but it's one of those that it's almost like a, you work so hard, you win 106 games. You kind of want a decent shot at making it. But then all of a sudden, you now have two extra teams who can come in and spoil that. And it just kind of seems like it's not worth putting in the effort to get the number one seed. Yeah, it's it's a baseball thing. It's it's an inherent thing to the sport that there's a lot of uh, weird stuff that happens, a lot of strange outcomes. And the worst team wins a lot of times. Um, and I think that's a like kind of an argument for why the playoff should be smaller. Yeah. And I, 10 was already like, I don't want to say too much. Cause I, I liked 10, the wild card series should have been, or the wild card game should have been a wild card series. And then it move on from there, but it gives two different teams the chance to be the spoiler, but only really allows one spoiler to potentially play in against the division winners. Uh, and that would be for the case where you have like the Dodgers and the Giants out of the same division being the top two teams. That's why I liked it the way it was. This is almost adding a little bit too much unpredictability to me. So, but then again, I'm old and cranky and I'm going to wave my fist at the sky for a while. So, eh. <laughs> that's right. Um, roster construction the rosters will be 26 men once again. And this year they'll be enforcing the rule for uh, 13 pitchers and 13 hitters on the roster at a time. And for service time manipulation in the CBA, they included some different things about, uh, having prospects on the roster from day one, or at least able to be accruing a full year of service time and then that team would be rewarded with additional draft picks so yeah and, and so essentially what's going to happen there is the um the top 100 lists are going to become even more important almost uh so your baseball america your mlb.com and your espn top 100s those basically determine 
um, who is potentially going to be called up before um, or like at opening day or in that first week. Uh, Cause anyone in those lists, if they're, or when they still have rookie status, if they're called up before uh, they would get less than a full year of service time, um, if they go on in the next three years, three whole years to win rookie of the year, finish top three in MVP or Cy Young, um, then their team receives a uh, first round draft pick. And if the international draft does get implemented in uh, July, whenever they're supposed to come to an agreement on whether they do international draft or not, uh, there could be two more picks on the table for the international draft as well. So those those top 100 lists get a lot more important here now because they actually kind of mean something for the major league team. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if this year uh, this actually comes into play if we see more uh, top 100 prospects on opening day rosters. I kind of think you I kind of think you might. I've been seeing a yeah. lot of uh, a lot of talk at different camps of like the number one prospects for each team, like getting a lot more reps with the big league clubs, um, even if they're non roster invitees. Um, Cause like Nolan Gorman has been doing a lot of drills with at second base with the big league club um, instead of with the minor leagues or the, the second string guys, uh, if you will. So, and I know other teams have had their top prospects doing that as well. So it'd be interesting to see. Okay. So that is uh, just a real quick uh, summary on some of the key stuff from the CBA. What do you say we move on and talk some uh, trades and free agent signings? Let's do it. I'm checking here in the background to make sure we haven't missed anything in the. I think we're going to get some minutes. breaking news during this uh, during this hour, probably. I kind of think so too. All right, so we'll start off with what I think is probably the biggest uh, deal, and that's that Freddie Freeman will not be returning to the Atlanta Braves. A cornerstone player, 2020 MVP, World Series champion in 2021. I mean. The guy's a hero. The, the, the bridge from the Chipper era to the Acuna era. Right? Yeah. I, I do so, find it funny that the thing that you think is the biggest deal is actually a not a non-deal. A non-deal? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, Ray Freeman's still out on the market. About four or five teams have been linked to him, and I'm not sure what's going on there. I'm very surprised he hasn't signed yet. But the reason we know he's not coming back is because Matt Olson. Uh, excellent first baseman, formerly of the A's, got traded to the Braves um, a couple days ago. And uh, it was a huge deal uh, involving four prospects going back to Oakland, including Christian Pache, Shea Langliers, uh, Ryan Cusick, and Joey Estes. The, the last two are uh, pretty young pitchers. Um, Pache and Langliers, really excellent defensive players, They've got questions with their bats, but they end up being anything close to kind of league average as hitters. They're going to be really uh, valuable players to the A's. So it's a really strong prospect haul overall. Yeah, I I actually I really like this trade from the A's standpoint. Um, I like it from the Braves standpoint too, but I'm a little bit I got a sour taste in my mouth there. Besides the fact that they're trading like an awesome player, like you can never really be like that's a great trade, but at the same time, it's it's a it's a fair for, return, I'd say. Yeah, for as far as what Oakland does, this is the this is a really good thing because we all knew that they were going to get rid of him no matter what. So this return is fantastic. Like Pache is, uh, he's a top hundred prospect. He's played in the majors before. He's kind of your prototypical uh, center fielder, really, really fast, really great glove. He's kind of a light hitter, but he's still a really good player, and uh, he's a great personality. I mean, I've been following him on Twitter here for the last couple weeks, and I kind of like it. He's just a really nice guy, it seems like. So I think he'll do really well out there in in Oakland. And Shea Langoliers was actually, I thought Shea was going to be the uh, starting catcher for the Braves here starting next year. Like I thought he was their guy. Um, and so seeing him go, 
I guess the Braves are putting a lot of faith uh, now in Darno keeping his bat going for a couple more years and then William Contreras to uh, kind of break out or they're going to wait till next off season. And if Wilson Contreras doesn't sign an extension, maybe they're in on the Wilson sweepstakes. Who knows? Um, yeah. Um, and then on the other side of it, so Olsen goes back and the next day he signs a $168 million eight year extension. So most of the money that was probably allocated or not allocated to Freddie is going to Matt Olsen. And, um, you know, he's younger. He's obviously four years younger than Freddie. First baseman don't age super well. Um, but it's it leaves a bad taste in my mouth that they're doing this because of what Freddie means to the franchise and the fact that Olsen's – people are kind of overlooking the fact that Olsen's coming off his career season. Who knows if all those gains stick. He cut his strikeout rate by, like, a ridiculous amount. Who knows? It, like, it's very unlikely he's going to be able to repeat what he did last year even. Yeah, I, I would actually like to step back just a, a few sentences there to something you said. It leaves a uh, poor taste in your mouth because what Freddie means to the Braves. It leaves a poor taste in my mouth because of what if Freddie on the Braves means to Major League Baseball. Because Freddie on the Braves is kind of one of those things that I think all baseball fans ever like they don't want to see Freddie leave the Braves. It, it's one of those that it's like, that's who I think about. He is Mr. Brave. It's like if Joey Votto were to not be on the Reds anymore. It would be weird. I wouldn't like it. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of when Albert left the Cardinals, except this is a like even, I guess it's really not that much later in his career, but it just almost feels like this one can't be undone almost like I'm never going to be able to think of this man not on the Braves like he was Chipper Jones after Chipper retired right yeah uh, um yeah and then even from the from the Brave side like from a, a trading and a value perspective so they are saving money because Freddie's most likely going to be making like a higher salary on average for wherever he signs but they also paid all those they, they paid the price of giving up those four huge prospects for them. And they're probably getting a lesser player. So, yeah. it, and it, it's all just so they could save like roughly $50 million. Yeah. You know? And, and it's, uh, it's ridiculous. They make a hundred million dollars in profit a year. Yeah. So they're coming off a world series. Like they're, they're doing fine. Yeah. And they're not owned by an individual person either. They're owned by a corporation. Right. So like, it, it's not even like one greedy person. It's a I mean, entire board happens, of greedy people. They're, they don't they don't have any feel for the situation. They don't really care. It's just it's just yeah. a money game. Yeah, to them it is a money game. Like yeah, like it's a money game to all of them. But like Steve Cohen's kind of showing that he he would really like to win. He's been a lifelong Mets fan. Yeah, and then this is just like not Skynet. What is this? Liberty Media. Yeah, Liberty Media, and I honestly don't even know what Liberty Media owns. They're like a cable company, essentially. Okay. But yeah, it's it's interesting. I I do think the uh, the other thing that could potentially come from this this particular um, trade is uh, I th I think that this opens the door for the. Uh, A's to move Sean Murphy and load up on more prospects because Shea Langoliers is a uh, AAA catcher right now. So he's maybe half a year away from may maybe a full year away from uh, being a big league regular. And yeah. so if you can hold over for that, a year. That, uh, that A's lineup right now, it's not looking pretty at all. It's, it's I, rough. I honestly think they're in a race to be the worst team in the league. Very possible yeah um especially if they trade more of their pitchers uh it's rumored that sean Manaya or frankie montas or both could be on the move here soon and then maybe murphy as well so yeah granted we'll Mur see. murphy's been rumored n not very much that's that's one that like fans are just kind of expecting based on the way that everything else has been going true so yeah um i guess we'll uh just quickly hit on freddie i guess while we're already here so freddie 
is talking to, we've heard that, that some teams are in on them, like the Red Sox, the Padres, the Dodgers. Um, is anyone else really in on him? Not, at this point? not anymore. There are teams that were that, uh, because he's taken so long, they've pivoted and gone elsewhere. Like the Yankees went and got Rizzo. Um, the, Jays. the the Jays went and made a move that we'll talk about here in a minute. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think it's down to basically those three in, in the, the Padres, Dodgers and Red Sox. So. Okay. Yeah. Let's just skip to that, uh, that A's trade then while we're already talking about them. So, yeah, so, so the A's, uh, or the, sorry, the Jays, uh, decided that they weren't going to wait on Freddie anymore. They wanted to make a move and they wanted to make it now. So they went back to the A's uh, who just traded Matt Olson and they said, you got any more mats? Yeah. Uh, a good, def- yes, we do. A, a good defensive mat that plays the corner infield position. Yeah. We'll, we'll take him for a bunch of really good prospects. Um, so Matt Chapman is on his way back to Toronto uh, in return for Zach Logue, uh, a major league ready pitcher, uh, Kirby Sneed, um kevin smith and gunner hoagland um and that is a in my opinion that is a huge return that's three top 30 prospects uh for for the jays kevin smith is a really good uh basically major league ready infielder gunner hoagland was the 2021 first round uh pick fantastic pitcher um zach Logue is major league ready he's a top 30 guy he's a really good pitcher and then kirby sneed is kind of the wild card there for me yeah, and then on the other side of it, the Jays got Matt Chapman. Like, I love this move for them. Matt Chapman um, in 2021 really had a really tough year offensively. He, uh, you know, there's really no way to get around it. He was not good. He was nothing the player that he was in, like, 2018 and 2019 before his uh, hip injury. But on the defensive side, he was still the absolute, like, one of probably the best third baseman in the league defensively. Yeah. And Andy he had, had to, bad, Andy bad had to cover that massive area in Oakland as well. So yeah. And with with all that being said, he put up three and a half war in the twenty twenty one season, even in a really bad offensive season. Now he goes to Toronto and he's able to be probably the seventh or eighth best hitter in that lineup. Yeah. So the pressure is and, not even on him. If he gets back to the 18, 19 levels, we're talking about like uh, a stud in this lineup that's filled with studs. Yeah, and, and this is a guy who, in his down season, still hit fifteen or uh, twenty-seven home runs. Yeah, the power like, has gone nowhere. Yeah. yeah, his his average came down from about two fifty to two seventy, all the way down to two ten. Um, but his his power definitely held him in there his his obp dropped a bit um uh fangraphs is is down right now so this is difficult for me i'm not used to looking at uh, baseball reference anymore <laughs> hard to read uh yeah but with chapman like they they're just counting on him to provide that good defense and he's a great great pre- player whether he uh hits or not and i would bet on him bouncing back I don't, yeah. I don't know about you. Uh, I, I would too. Um, and he's 29 years old, so he's kind of right in his prime. Um, so you're going to get a couple uh, really good years out of him, and he's got two more years left on his deal. Or not a, not his deal. He's got uh, two more years of ARB. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Oh, it, yes, because he didn't... Uh, 2017, he didn't get a full year of service time. I Yeah. I really need my... Uh, my favorite site back so I can understand what's happening. What happened to Fangraphs? I don't know. It just told me the uh, page not found. Oh, okay. Probably uh, Freddie Freeman broke the site or something. Honestly, probably. Um, But yeah, so the the A's are in fire sale mode. Um, There was one more rumor on the J's, though, that they would potentially mm. be looking at a trade for Jose Ramirez. To add to this lineup, like I can't even. That is just mind-boggling. I would love to see that. Yeah, that that would be insane. I was actually talking to someone about it today, and um, 
we were talking like to get that done, it would almost have to be Jordan Groshans and uh, Cleveland wants uh, Alec Manoa, which isn't going to happen. Um, but it would have to be like Jordan Groshans and Manoa and a couple other guys. Oh yeah, the haul would be absolutely massive. So you would you would think that they probably won't do it right after making a pretty big trade uh, for Chapman, but. You never know, man. They're pushing all their chips in, and I, I love it. Yeah, same. Like, they they see an opportunity to basically take the AL East in, in a stranglehold. Like, the Yankees have not made as many moves as some people expected. The Red Sox have not really done anything yet. The Rays are going to be good still. But they're seeing this as an opportunity, especially with that expanded playoff, that if they can get if they can win this division, they think they're going to lock in the, uh, the buy. So. All right. Uh, how about we move on to the Yankees and talk about the various things that they've done, which are before we talk about the Yankees, do we need to talk about the twins? The twins? Yeah. Okay. We yeah. Cause I mean, twins. otherwise we're going out of order. <laughs> <laughs> the order is just a mess right now, but, uh, that's fine. Yeah, so the Twins have made multiple moves uh, through tr- trades to this point. So the first trade they made was uh, one with Texas, where they traded uh, Mitch Garver, their starting catcher, for a prospect, Ronnie Henriquez, and uh, Isaiah kiner falefa So it was looking like Isaiah kiner falefa was going to be the starting shortstop for the Twins. Then the next day, they turn around and they trade him and Josh Donaldson to the Yankees. Uh, and and uh, catcher Ben Rortbet to the Yankees for Gary Sanchez uh, and uh, Gio Urshela. Oh yeah, and Gio Urshela. So that was that was a massive trade because uh, it it just like was like what are we doing here exactly for both sides really break this one down. Yeah. So. <sighs> I, now that I'm looking at this, I actually am thinking this might be a worse deal for uh, for the Twins than I originally thought, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So, essentially, uh, Josh Donaldson has uh, like 50 mil left on his contract, and the Yankees took on all of that, and they get Isaiah Kiner-Falefa to come in and be their shortstop, uh, as well as getting Ben Rortbet uh, to be a backup catcher now that uh, Gary is out. Gary, I don't know if Gary's going to be good or not. He's got massive amounts of power and he's not really been very good other than that for the last couple of years. Like he's not good defensively at catcher. He can't he's really gonna be able to play some more DH and maybe he'll, he'll hit better. Yeah, wow. that's, that's fair. Um, I, I could see that too. Um, but the big get here is Gio Urshela. Um, Gio Urshela is a really, really, really good, uh, young player for the Yankees or, um, and now coming over to the twins, he can slot in at shortstop where they have a huge gaping hole. Um, or ideally, ideally you'd move him over to third and get a better shortstop. Um, but, uh, shoot, I had a thought and then I lost it. Um, oh, but yeah, but, uh, and then they send off Donaldson, they cut uh, quite a bit of money um, in salary there, uh, and it basically opens them up to go out and try and get a guy like Trevor Story, who they've been rumored to be talking with. Um, and if if they can make that happen, then you turn Mitch Garver and Josh Donaldson, an overpaid, um, still effective, but not, not in his prime third baseman, and a uh, really good catcher uh, with a lot of pop, you turn those two into Gio Urshela, uh, maybe DH Gary Sanchez, and Trevor Story, that'd be huge. Yeah, it kind of hinges on them like adding someone like Story. I mean, Story makes just too much sense right now, but if they don't get him, then it looks really bad, I think. Yeah, because if, if you don't Donaldson, get him... If you're, not re- you're not replacing Donaldson's bat in the lineup. At all. Well, and you're not replacing Garver's bat either. No, exactly. Because, like, Gary is not Mitch Garber. He's not, but, I mean, that's like that's kind of similar. It's, it's, it's a lot closer, but, uh, 
basically at that point you're giving away Garver to clear 50 million in cap space is essentially or cap space. This isn't the NFL. Um, they clear 50 million in, in, uh, in money. And then you do get Gio Urshela, who is a step up for that team. He doesn't replace Donaldson, but he is a huge, huge plus for that team. Yes. And the twins have also, uh, added Sonny Gray from the Reds. Uh, he, uh, was traded for a young pitcher, 2021 20, first round pick, Chase Petty. So they're bolstering their starting pitching. Obviously, we've talked about that uh, situation, that they definitely need some more help there. But it's a, it's a good first step. They definitely need to do more. They need to sign another pitcher or make a trade for Manaya or Montas, which would fit um, if they're really trying to go for it this year. Yeah. Um, on the Yankee side of that trade, though, I like that they got Donaldson. I think he's better than Urshela. The catcher thing is weird to me, though, because this Ben Rort bet, I, I can't say I'm super familiar with him, but he does not have great um, hitting numbers at all. And beyond him, all they have is Kyle Higashioka. So I think catcher's like a huge need for them. And I can see them being a fit for Murphy if they can swing that deal. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's the... That's the reason I, I think they made that move is I think they think Murphy is attainable because uh, Higgy, Higgy has been good for them in the past at catcher, but he's not a 140 game a year catcher. No, um, not at all. And, and this short vet guy, I don't know him either, um, but I, I don't know. That, that's a gaping hole for them, and they were not happy with Gary, and Gary actually could produce some offense. Right. Not yeah. often, based on his uh, like sub eighty average or whatever it was. Like, he was awful, yeah. but really, really bad. Yeah, but yeah, I I don't know, and and I really like Kiner Falefa here too. Um, I I think people, not enough people know Isaiah Kiner Falefa. This is a dude that he's not like the biggest bat in the world, but he is a really really good player, and he will do anything that that team asks. Hell, he he caught full time for a year as a third baseman. Yeah, like, he's supposed supposedly uh, a great defender. Um, the metrics don't necessarily back that up at shortstop, but I don't I don't necessarily trust those metrics that much. But he can play multiple positions, and he's kind of the anti Yankee in a lot of ways. He he's not like one of these big uh, sluggers. He's He's a contact first guy. Yeah. So I, I think it'll be really interesting to see how he does in New York because he's not what they're used to. Like Donaldson no. sounds like a, a Yankees move to me. Yeah, definitely. Like, he's a Yankee. Oh, that for sure. Sense. But yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, the other thing that I think the Yankees might do be interested in is trying to get a uh, another pitcher. So, like, I know they have been talking with the A's about getting Manaya or Montas. Everyone wants Manaya or Montas. Yeah, and and there's other teams who we're not going to talk about at all tonight that definitely need to be talking about Manaya and Montas, uh, especially with some news they've been getting. That wasn't so, uh, so. The A's they really should do very well on the returns for those guys. I'd say. If yeah. they can get some teams bidding against each other. For sure. Everyone needs starting pitchers. So we've talked a, uh, about the A's tearing it down, blowing it up. But they're not the only team that's doing it. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the Reds and get this out oh, of here. Because no. we've already talked about them trading Sonny Gray for Chase Petty. Um, that That move alone signaled what... Uh, a lot of Reds fans were worried was going to happen. And we've honestly is... been saying it all winter. We've we've said it from the very first move they made when they traded Tucker Barnhart. This team's yep. tearing it down. This team's not trying to compete. Yep. Uh, what was and... the other move that they made? Uh, the the uh, waving of Wade Miley, yep. losing him to a division rival, like to clear it, ten million dollars of money for one year on an option. Yes. 
Um, so they did that, and that move made zero sense because they just DFA'd him. That's it. They didn't try and trade him, nothing. Um, now they go out, they trade Sonny Gray. Well, and then yesterday, they went and made what uh, some people are calling a blockbuster trade. Um, and all right, we do have some breaking news. Do you know Nick Martinez? Yeah, the guy that signed with the Padres. Yes. Did did they, that just they, happen? That happened before the lockout, but the deal was not. Official oh, that's that lockout. one. Yeah. Okay, pre lockout is finally done. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> um, didn't fall through. It didn't fall through. Uh, what was I talking about? That? Oh, yeah. So the the, uh, the blockbuster trade for the Reds. Um, Jesse Winker and a Eugenio Suarez traded away from the Reds to the Mariners, which at face value is a huge, huge get for the Mariners. Um, and all the Mariners had to give up was Justin Dunn, a youngish pitcher who has uh, had flashes of being good and then flashes of being not so good. Um, Jake Fraley, uh, an outfielder that's kind of the same way. Um, more flashes of okay than great, but, and then Brandon Williamson, who, if I, I think he's the big get really in this deal for the Reds, like he is a pretty good left-handed pitching prospect. Um, I think that he was like the main, main draw of this trade. Cause like with Dunn, he's not exactly super young at this point and he's never really taken the next step. Now he's going to pitch in Cincinnati, like. It's not going to go great for him, I don't think, unfortunately. And then with Fraley, guy has some speed. Um, he's got some on base skills, but I don't know. I don't know if this guy can hit. He's going to get his ch- chance in Cincinnati, though. Yeah, he's definitely going to get his chance. And he's got some speed, which I think would be interesting. And the Reds don't have any like actual outfielders. They've been trying to fill center field for years. And they've thrown a whole bunch of non-outfielders there. Jake Fraley at least gives them a guy that they could throw in center field, and he's played it before, and he's capable defensively. Like, if they could build around him, he'd be an okay center fielder, a light-hitting, fast center fielder, kind of the prototype, if they had any semblance of a roster around him, which there there's none. Like, he's now their main bat, other than Joey Votto. And Jonathan India, but I guess Tyler Stevenson. So yeah, but he's their fourth bat. <laughs> so so basically, the Reds tore it down. Um, they were they were like the first team out of the playoffs last year. So really, you know, competitive team and everything. And then now they're they're basically saying we're not we're not going to compete, even though they're publicly saying. Oh, we're going to reinvest the money that we're saving from the trades and go back into the free agent market, but yeah. I, I just can't see it. They they did come out today and basically say Castillo and Mali are off limits. Yeah. But I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into that. No, we'll see how long that lasts. Like, it might go into the season and they have them, but before the trade deadline, one of those two's gone. But, so we'll we'll see. But um, they're kind of the other team with the A's that's kind of in the race to the bottom. Um, I honestly think that we might have a new worst team in the league this year. I think the Pirates haven't got a lot better, but they've got better. The um, the Orioles, I think, are going to improve a lot just because Adley's going to come up pretty early on. He's He uh, is hurt right now, and he's going to miss opening day. So that's... That's a bummer, but I think they improve a lot. And then uh, you and I both think that the Diamondbacks weren't as bad as they were, or as they seem to be. So I still think the Rockies stink. Yes, pretty much. (laughs) They could they could be pretty bad, but they obviously added Chris Bryant today. So well, and they uh, somehow always managed to win like seventy games. Yeah. So they're not going to be the worst team in the league. But I, no. I think the Reds or the A's could legitimately be the worst team in the league this year. Yeah, if the, if the A's, whoever trades their pitchers first is going to be the worst team, probably. Yep. So. 
so we didn't really talk about the Seattle side of it. So they, they got Winker, who's an excellent hitter against right-handed uh, pitchers, uh, struggles against lefties, so he might like platoon a little bit more than he did with the Reds. And then Suarez, who has prodigious power, but has really struggled with the batting average the last couple of years. Yeah. And they're both going to a park or they're, they're coming from a uh, Homer friendly park. Um, I think if I remember right, uh, park factors, basically great American is the second most hitter friendly park in the, in the major leagues. Right. Yeah. And by some offensive things, it's like number one, I think it's number one for home runs actually. Okay. So it's, it's the number one park for home runs and now they're going to uh, T-Mobile, which is, not even Horrible. remotely close to the most homer friendly park. And for lefties like Winker, it's one of the absolute worst, I think, for homers and average and is, everything. So. Is it a worse homer park than Bush? Because like Bush isn't good. Bush is no Bush is Bush is near the bottom as well. Yeah, it's like Bush, uh, Oracle Park, and uh, T Mobile. Marlins Park, because Marlins Park is the exact same dimensions but, as. They changed the dimensions a few years ago. Oh, did they? Yeah. Okay. They made it a little bit more hitter friendly, I think. But gotcha. Um, um. But yeah, I think that helps them, the Mariners, anyways, because they're good players. Whether they're going to get killed by the park factors or not doesn't it, matter. Like, yeah, it it takes Jesse Winker from being like one of the best hitters in the league against righties to being like a really good hitter in the league against righties. Um, for 81 games. And then the other 81 games, all bets are off. He could be amazing. But, uh, and, and Suarez, so uh, the, the interesting thing to me here is, so Suarez kind of went as purely a salary dump. He's got 35 million left over two years or something. And yeah, it's, not, it's nothing crazy, really. And they salary dumped it so that they just got rid of the money and got nothing in return. Because the Reds have done salary dumps before where they threw in their top prospects, like Jeter Downs and um, um, who's the other one? Josiah, that went? Josiah Gray. Yeah, so Jeter Downs and Josiah Gray going to the uh, Dodgers along with... Uh, I don't Homer know. Bailey. Is that who it was? Was it Homer Bailey? I think so. I believe so. Interesting. Um, and oh, the Puig trade. Right. Yeah. And it didn't go the Reds way. So now they've decided they're going to do it the other way, where they give up guys with big and contracts. Their best player, and with their best player. With maybe. their best player and get nothing back, essentially. Yeah, like, it's, uh, it's garbage. Like, Williamson is good, but Williamson is not an even trade for Winker. No. So, yeah. I don't know. I yeah. I definitely think the Mariners won that trade pretty much no matter what. Yeah, I'd say so. And I I really think uh, Suarez is also gonna like play better than he has. Oh, he he, he was he, awesome he at the the last luck. month and a half of last year. Yep. So, I think he even hit for like a three sixty average or something in September, didn't he? Yeah, he hit like three seventy in September. So maybe that's what's coming yeah maybe um let's see and then the other thing that the the reds did um is they traded their uh presumed closer or a guy who has been their closer in the past uh after rysel was traded in amir garrett to the um the Royal. kansas city royals for mike minor straight up no money exchanged hands I think the Royals gave some money for Did his buyout they? or something, but well, yeah, but much. it was only a million dollars for the the option buyout. Yeah, that's what they. I think that was the cash exchange. If I okay, I, I don't know. For so sure. so basically, the Reds are still paying ten million dollars uh, to uh, Mike Miner after they DFA'd Wade Miley earlier this offseason because he was going to make ten million dollars if they picked up the option, and they traded. Sonny Gray, who's a clear, clear better pitcher, who's making like twelve or fourteen million, so it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, like, I don't know what they're doing. So, I I think at this point they're just trying to make fans mad. They're 
there's been um, protesters out in front of Great American Ballpark every day for the last week um, protesting for the owner to sell the team. Sell like the team. Or trade Joey Votto to a contender. That well, be both. Watch. Trade Joey Votto first and then sell the team. Do you think Joey Votto would say yes to a trade? Because he, he likes being a red, I feel yeah, like. I was going to say, I don't think he's he would. a red. Yeah. But at the same time, he he also wants to win. So I don't I don't really know if he would say yes or no. Okay. Right, I, I'm looking on. at our rundown here, and I think when we were talking about the Yankees, we forgot to talk about Rizzo. Oh, yeah. We can mention Rizzo. So Rizzo is back with the Yankees, $32 million for two years. He's got an opt-out after that first year. So that pretty much took uh, the Yankees out of the Freeman running. Yeah. And it's a good get for, for the Yankees, and it's, you know, pretty De- solid. Depending on vaccine rules and status, uh, Rizzo may only be able to play 70 games for the uh, Yankees this year. So see how that goes. Same with Aaron Judge, but he's not a new free agent signing. So. (laughs) Um, All right. What team we got next? Uh, Let's talk about the Cubs. So. Ew, gross. The Cubs signed Japanese (laughs) sensation Seiya Suzuki. To a eighty-five million dollar deal for five years with a no trade clause, so it's a massive commitment. It's the biggest uh, contract given out to a Japanese position player coming to MLB in history. Um, the no trade thing was pretty interesting to me because uh, when Theo Epstein was the president of the Cubs, like they rarely have ever gave out no trade clauses. So Jed Jed Hoyer is doing things a little bit differently and. It shows that um, the Cubs are looking to get back into contention sooner rather than later. This is not a this is not a teardown. You don't make this move if you're trying to take two to three years to rebuild. So I see the Cubs getting back into um, playoff contention like in 2023 at the worst now. Yeah, and and this is a this is a huge get for the Cubs. Um, there were about nine or 10 teams that were all in on Suzuki trying to get him. Uh, it sounds like the, the biggest, um, the biggest aggressors in that market were, were the Padres and the Cubs. Um, but th- this is massive. I mean, after the posting fees, this is a hundred million dollars you're committing to, to this guy who, um, he, he's the Mike Trout of the MPB. Like he's really good. MPB to the MLB, there is a bit of a difference, so we'll see how much that translates over here. Um, like I expect him to be really, really good still, and obviously the Cubs do too. Um, but yeah, then I the, think one, there might be like a little bit of a learning curve, but the guy's shown over his nine years in Japan that he's been incredibly consistent. He has major power. Uh, he hit 38 home runs last year and hit 317. So and he's only like, 27. So he's yeah, so he's, he's right still yeah yeah. Um, he's got probably three to four prime years left and they get him for five years. So I, I would do that deal in a heartbeat if I were them too. So, uh, and compared and th- to some of the other, uh, outfielders that are on the market this year, they're basically, they're, they're getting a huge discount on him. If he plays anything like a Chris Bryan or a Castellanos or a Conforter or anything like that. Yeah. Cause essentially you're getting him for 15 mil a year, AAV, uh, 20, if you count the posting fee. But that's I think it's eighty it's eighty five for the for the five years, so seventeen, right? Oh, is that seventeen? Yeah. Ah, my bad. M- m- quick math. Didn't work out. Uh I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um but that's not the only move the Cubs have made. That's the biggest move the Cubs have made. But we've talked about Strowman before the lockout, and then yep. the Cubs did go out and sign in Droughton Simmons to I think one year four mil. Um yep. and it, that's that's not a huge flashy move, but Andrew Elton has been really, really good in the past. He had a pretty down last year, year and a half. Uh, he's like a 30 year old shortstop. So we'll see what happens, but $4 million, you get a, a veteran to play short. So you could keep Nico at second. Um, and it doesn't necessarily preclude the Cubs from going out and making a big move that is still on the table. Yeah. So. Even with the Suzuki signing and some of the other uh, reliever signings they've made, I think they're 
payroll number is like around 140 million right now. So they've got plenty of money to continue to spend if they like to. Yeah. And they really should be doing that. Yeah, especially if they want to contend next year cuz the the Cardinals and the Brewers are set up to uh basically be competitive for the foreseeable future. So depending on how the uh the Brewers lineup works out and if it continues to falter, that's kind of where they need to spend money if they do. The Cardinals pitching staff is pretty thin so the the cubs with a few key moves could be right there in the hunt and by next year could take the division back so we'll see what uh jed and the other guy what's carter the, hawkins and yeah, carter yeah. hawkins do so yeah oh i just remember one move that i forgot to write on the sheet but we were talking about the brewers that's andrew mccutcheon is signing with the brewers to be their dh so, I hate the Brewers um, because they sign the guys that I like, and I don't like them. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, Kutch was a pirate, but that's I've never really hated the Pirates because they suck. <laughs> like, yeah. So that was a pretty solid move for for Brewers. Yeah, and they do plan on uh, DH and Kutch most of the year, but he is gonna. Uh, stay in shape and ready to play in the field if need be. So. All right. What else we got here? Uh, Another former Cub, Kyle Schwarber signed a massive deal with the Phillies, 79 million for four years. Um, And he's, he's going to be their left fielder actually. So he's not going to be just stuck at first base or DH for the most part. Uh, They're kind of leaning into their thing of having awful defense. But they don't care. They're they're gonna try to out hit everybody. Yeah, I mean, I realize that they didn't have a left fielder really because Kutch was not yeah. there anymore. But also, there's not anyone else so that you could just like. So I'm the I'm one of the people that believes that Schwarber is a lot better defensively than people give him credit for. But still. But still, yeah. <laughs> Like, when you look around the rest of the diamond, like they don't have very strong defenders anywhere else. So it, you, can't, yeah. Schwar- you can't really hide Schwarber. Schwarber is one of those, if you have a good rest of the defense, you can definitely tolerate him in left. If you sure. have a bad defensive team, he's going to be like the rest of the team. So And center field is like a big question too. So they brought back Odubel Herrera. They have a young, young guy, Matt Beerling. There's... They're projected to split that center field role. That's kind of uh they're both kind of question marked, I'd say. Um is this Mickey Maniac's like year? Maybe. Like he he might be the guy that could handle center field the best. We'll see. But uh any other thoughts on Schwarber? Uh just the fact that Schwarber and Bryce hitting back to back in a lineup for four years. Oh my God, that's gonna be fun. How many times are they gonna hit back to backs over that four year period? I'm I'm going no less than twenty. Yeah, if they can get Hoskins, uh, you know, healthy and everything, that'll be that'll be a fun middle of the lineup for sure. Yeah, well, fun for fans of not the team they're facing that day. Yeah, that. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, some some uh, shorter term deals that were signed. Nelson Cruz, forty one year old Nelson Cruz, is going to play with Juan Soto in Washington. Um, so I'm talking about the middle of the the Nationals lineup. So they've got uh, Soto, Cruz, and Josh Bell. Those three guys in the middle of any lineup is pretty awesome. But the top of the lineup and the bottom of the lineup. Who, who do we even have? Like it's Victor not, Robles it's leading off. Gross. Yeah. Um, which uh, not the worst leadoff guy, but definitely not enough contact there to feel comfortable for me, at least. That's Cesar uh, Hernandez. Carter Keboom, well, I imagine. Yeah, somewhere in there. Um, you got Kabert. Kabert's probably fine as far as the catcher's concerned. Kabert, Kabert's fine. Um. Yeah. yeah other than that, I don't. I don't really know. <laughs> So well, one thing I was thinking about with Soto, so I'm I'm assuming Cruz is going to hit right behind Soto in the lineup. Yeah. So Soto is going to get like 
pitch to a lot more. They can't work around them because Cruz is right there. So I think it could help Soto a lot. Yeah. Yeah, because... Like, I would still rather pitch to Cruz than Soto, but you can't walk Soto before Cruz. No, exactly, so it's like, yeah. eh. And he's going to a really nice uh, hitting environment, so he doesn't have to deal with whatever he, he was doing at uh, the end of last season where he was probably struggling in the trop with the batter's eye and everything. So I think Cruz is kind of like a machine. It doesn't really matter how old he is. He's just going to continue to do what he does until he decides that he doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, and then, okay. oh, we did have actually one more um, sell off by the A's that we completely forgot about. Oh, Chris Bassett? Chris that Bassett to the Mets. Yeah, that one was <laughs> misplaced here on the sheet. So, yeah, Chris Bassett got traded to the Mets. That really shores up the um, Mets rotation, which is one of the strongest in the league. So, Bassett's basically their number three behind. Uh, DeGrom and Scherzer. The fact that point. Scherzer is a number two amazes yeah, right. me. I mean, he, he would be a number one on literally every other team in the league, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it just, it still just amazes me that, like, he'd go to a team where he's not the ace and, like, he's still an ace. There's just a younger guy who's equally as good. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah. So, but Bassett's kind of just a steady guy. I'm not the biggest fan of him, but. Like you can't you can't argue with his results. He's been very good the last few years. No. Uh, they did. The Mets gave up uh, two pitching prospects. One JT Ginn, who was a 2020 second round pick. I think he's recovering from uh, Tommy John. And Adam Aller, who's a 26 or 27 year old guy who's about ready for the majors. So another pretty solid return for the A's. And then let's see where to go from here. Do we want to just hit some quick and then talk about guys that are left? Or do we want to just continue talking through the other moves? We don't, have too, many, here? We don't have too many left. We'll just keep going. I think. All right. So the Dodgers, their big move is bringing back Clayton Kershaw for one more year. Um, I, I don't know if that means that he's taking a victory lap and going to retire uh, young or if, He's just going to take one year deals for a couple years until he figures out what he wants to do. Um, but 17 mil Kershaw coming back. Um, he's dealt with some injuries the past couple years and not pitched the whole season, but I still really like that move. It, Kershaw is one of those that it would be so weird to me if he pitched for any other team. Like I know there's been a lot of Kershaw to the Rangers rumors because he's from Texas, but I, I, I don't want him to ever play for any other team. So. Yeah, but I, I was, uh, I'm sort of concerned about that one because he took less than even the qualifying offer amount. So I wonder if there's like something going on with the health that they're really not sure about, but I don't have a lot of confidence that he's going to make it through a full season. Unfortunately. Yeah. I I don't either, but. As you always tell me, it's a one-year deal. There's no way it's a bad deal. That's true. 100%, so, yeah. Uh, another guy with uh, big health issues and questions, Carlos Rodon, who when he's pitching and um, pitching the way he did with the White Sox in 2021, like he's awesome. He's top-tier pitcher. He goes to the Giants for two years for $44 million. So this is kind of similar, I guess, to the Kershaw situation. Rodon's also got an opt-out, and he's a lot younger. So if he decides, like, um, like if he has a great season and he stays healthy and everything, he can go back in the market and get a massive deal. Well, and there's been a lot of uh, different um, GMs that have basically said whenever they saw his uh, uh, Rodon's physical, like, this is the healthiest Rodon's been in years. Like, his shoulder looks great, they said. I don't know if I believe like, that, though. I mean... But with his history of of shoulder things, like, he's had a shoulder injury, like, for the last five years. I the mean, d- it could still be that... Now, it could still be that... No, the healthiest he has been. Yeah, no, I believe... That was I, the I key. Guess. Not he's healthy. 
<laughs> whether he's healthy now or whatever, like I don't know if it's gonna keep up. I sound so negative, but yeah, it's just like. I mean, I I shoulders. really really hope that Rodon can just be dominant over there. I, shoulders are the devil. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. Jack's Jack's gonna miss the beginning of the season because of his shoulder yeah. and Alex Reyes. Al's a, Al's a lie as well. Al's a lie. Yeah. Why do pitchers need shoulders? Just remove them. Right. Just Take sew them sew the arm straight back on. Get rid of the joint. Uh yeah. One other move that uh, Giants made is they brought Jock Peterson in um, for one year and six million. So that'll be going into their rotation of platoon guys. They're just filled with uh, platoon outfielders. It's like an even outfielders. year. Are we going to see Jocktober? Oh, yeah. Jocktober will always live. Is he going to wear the pearls, you think? <laughs> oh, man. I hope so. I um, also hope so, yeah. Let's see. But yeah. Zach I, Grinke. Zach Grinke back home to the Kansas City Royals. One year, $13 million. He's what, 39 years old now? 40 years old? 38, I think. 38? 38, 39, yeah. He's still got a little left in the tank. He's he's definitely been declining, but I think it'll be really nice to see Grinky go back. And he's not the most personable guy. I, I think we all know that. He's weird. Um, he's very quirky, yeah. But I do think that he could be a help, uh, s- at least somewhat, to these young pitchers they've got. And Brady Singer, Jackson Cowar, Daniel Lynch... Uh, the fourth one. Uh, Chris Bubich. Yeah, Bubich. Carlo, um, and Carlos Hernandez. Carlos Hernandez. Yeah. Um, and I, I think he he could be a huge help to those guys just from uh mechanics standpoint. Maybe not a mentality thing, but we'll see if he can help them come back and break through. And it kind of feels like one of those where he might retire after this year too, going back to where it all began. Kind of just feels like a full circle thing. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, I just realized that we totally forgot like one of the biggest ones, and that's the Chris Bryant deal. I think we need to talk about that. Oh goodness, I forgot about yeah, that so, too. So Chris Bryant today signed with the Colorado Rockies. He got a massive contract, one hundred eighty-two million for seven years. So he got paid like he's making more per year than than uh, Bryce Harper. His, his buddy there. So uh, yeah. what's going on with the Rockies? Like what, what are they doing exactly? I don't know. I, I do not understand it. They had a team that had a really, really good core and all they had to do was spend around it. Then they trade off Arenado with $51 million. They just let Trevor story walk. Uh, John Gray, they don't QO him. Like, and then now they go out and they're like, we want to compete. Let's sign Chris Bryant to a mega deal. And their other moves this offseason have been to get Colome and Jose Iglesias. It's not a team that's screaming, we're going to compete. That's right. a team that's screaming, oh, we don't have any like good players for the fans to come watch. Like, I guess we yeah. should get one. And yeah, like I, I don't blame them. I guess I, I'm never going to be mad that a team like goes and spends on a good player for their team. Like that's that's obviously a good thing. But the, the terms of the contract also, I don't understand because Chris Bryant's a great player and everything, but this is way above what anyone expected he would get. Were they just bidding against themselves? Were they, they just being the Rockies? Uh, probably. Like, I mean, who's going to give Chris Bryant seven years? Other than the Rockies, like, I, I he's he's thirty, he's right? Yeah, he's thirty. Yeah, I, the five-year deal is kind of about what I think he probably should have gotten. And what exactly changed in in just over a year since they traded Arenado? They're basically replacing him with Chris Bryant. They're they're taking all that well, money and giving it to Chris Bryant. Yeah, saving like a little bit of money. Like, why did they make the, that trade in the first place? Didn't that, make any sense. I, I think that was more Arenado being headstrong about wanting to compete. Like I, and I kind of wonder if Chris Bryant didn't talk to Arenado and story to see like what the deal was. Cause these were guys who seemed like they could potentially be lifers. If the team got competitive, they would give them the money and then we'd go on with a happy uh, Rockies fan base for the next 
like seven, eight, nine years. And then both of those guys basically within two years just completely turned on the franchise that brought them up and they won it out. And then Chris Bryant's just like, yeah, I'll go. Like, it is a lot of money to turn it, down. I mean, I it, it is a lot of money to turn down, but a full no trade clause, uh, granted that protects him, not so much them. Yeah, um, that's for him. But like, like Chris Bryant is a smart it, guy. Like is he, is he is he sure going? He what he wants. Like, is is he going with the mentality of force a trade in two years, but get a lot more money than I would have? That's not the Chris Bryant I know. Well, it, I, yeah, that, like that doesn't seem like him at all. Well, it it doesn't, but it's like that's the only logical thing I can think of because like I can't imagine that the culture in that franchise has gotten better in the last since Trevor Story became a free agent four months ago. So maybe uh, Chris Bryant is a culture changer. The maybe Rockies, like they might need something like that. I don't. I really need, don't know. need fresh eyes instead of the guys who've kind of been there and uh, been beaten Worn down. Out. Yeah. yeah, maybe. But it just it doesn't make any sense to me. Still, there's so it's many other be, teams. It's that... gonna be crazy. I, like I'm very excited to see what kind of numbers Chris Bryant puts up in Colorado, though. Like, oh yeah, for he's sure. Kind of, he's kind of built for that ballpark. Like he, he's gonna he's gonna do great. I think. Yeah. At least for the beginning of the deal, I don't know how it's gonna hold up. Yeah. All right, so I think we got two more that really, other than the terms of the deals, I don't know if there's a whole lot to say. Yeah, I'll just mention this quickly. So Yusei Kikuchi also signed with Toronto um, for the back end of their rotation. It's a very stacked one through five. Pretty much like this is the best uh, number five starter you can find anywhere in yeah. the league. Uh, he signed, as I say, he signed for three years and $36 million. Uh, And then Eddie Rosario... NLCS hero for the Braves is back with the Braves um, for 18 million in two years. Yeah. So both of those, I think are really good moves by those teams. Um, like you said, Kikuchi being uh, basically the best number five you could ask for. Um, it's about the same money that he would have got uh, this year in Seattle, but he got basically an extra two years tacked on. So good for him. And then Eddie going back um, to Atlanta, they definitely needed to address the outfield here this off season. And he did well for him last year. So glad to see him come back. Yep. So that brings us now to the guys that are still left on the board. And we have what two, three weeks until opening day, uh, basically exactly three weeks to opening day. And we still have Freddie Freeman, Carlos Correa, Nick Castellanos, Trevor Story, Jorge Soler, Kinley Jansen, Michael Conforto, Tommy Pham. And those are just the rest of the guys that were in the top 50 free agents at the beginning of this offseason. Like, yep. there's a whole bunch of other guys that are still available. So I guess, what what are your thoughts uh on any of those guys. I don't I don't know if you want to tell me who yeah, you think they're going to sign with or win or what, but go for yeah, it. Yeah, so with the Correa thing, I think now a couple of days ago, it was reported that the um, Astros were about to make a, a new offer to him. Then things just went completely silent. And we haven't really heard anything in the last two days about that. So I think the longer it goes like that, the more it makes me think that he could potentially pivot to a different team. But it's hard to it's hard to really know like who is involved on that at all. I yeah, I I don't know. There's every team needs him. Like every team every, in the league needs him, with the exception like of him. the Dodgers. But <laughs> yeah, um, and I guess the Rangers as well. But like he makes every single lineup and every single infield better. And the fact that there's all these teams that are basically taking themselves out is, I don't really get it, especially teams like the Yankees. Like, yeah, Kiner Falaf is really good, but you got all kinds of money and the luxury tax just went up and just go drop a whole bunch of cash on Correa. Just do it. Give him what he wants. He's probably worth it. Um, right, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. With I, with with uh, Castellanos, 
uh, he was apparently talking with Miami and Miami was really not kind of engaging him or going very hard after him. So that's just the reflection of that yeah. embarrassing franchise. I, I do think he's the next guy whose market heats up. Um, cause now that Schwarber's off the board, like they, they're both great DH types, but in my opinion, Schwarber was the bigger free agent there. I think he does have maybe a year or two in age, uh, a year or two yeah. younger, isn't he? Um, yeah. plus he's at least serviceable in the outfield. Whereas I would personally never put Nick Castellanos with a glove anywhere within like eight miles of a baseball field. Yeah. Um, so I I'm think, very curious to see what his landing spot is going to be, though. Same. Like we, I feel like there's been a lack of rumors on on teams that were like vying for him. Yeah, like I've not seen any rumors for Casty. Yeah. But. Um, and then, uh, story. I at this point, I don't think Story and Correa's markets overlap anymore. So I'm really kind of surprised that Story hasn't like his rumors haven't started heating up because like, it seems like the Correa is kind of still there in the um, Astros, uh, the Orioles. Um, as I mentioned, they offered him 10 years over $300 million. Um, I don't know if it's still on the table or not. Uh, people think that it is still on the table, uh, which that'd be huge for that rebuild, by the way. Um, and Adley is sh- like with Adley, him, uh, Mount Castle, um, uh, the pitcher that I'm forgetting his name, Grayson Rodriguez. I, I love thinking about how good that could be. But, like, what other teams are still in on Correa? Hard, that, to, hard to say, really. I don't, I don't, Padres, maybe? Like, like, the Cubs have the money to do it, and that would be a great fit. Yeah. But I don't think they're engaging on it, at least not for the, the years and the money that Correa wants. Yeah, I don't think they want to do the ten years thing. So yeah, you can get that somewhere else. Um, and we we talked about Freddie at the the top of the the segment here. Um, then yeah, the rest of these guys I think are great pieces pretty much anywhere. Uh, in Soler, Conforto, Fam, that's that's your your next three outfield guys. Um, now that uh, Bryant has a team, so I think they'll go pretty quick. And then that kind of leaves just Kenley. Like, where does he go? Uh, Miami, Texas. I don't know. I, I don't really know. It, pretty much every team, with the exception of the White Sox, could use Kenley. <laughs> oh, we forgot to talk about the White Sox. We did. Uh, the yeah. White Sox just went and added even more to their bullpen and got Joe Kelly on a two-year, seventeen and a half million dollar deal after getting Kendall Graveman earlier in the offseason. And they yeah. still have Liam Hendricks. They still have um, Kimbrel. They still yeah. have Bummer. They still have uh, uh, Garrett Crochet. Yeah. Like, it's, just, it's a ridiculous. It's an group. insane bullpen. Like, they probably should trade Kimbrel, but like, they don't need to. But just they got so many guys, and Kimbrel could add so much value to other teams. Like, it would make sense to me if they did trade him. I still think they need another outfielder, so maybe that would be the trade. Yeah. Or trade him and then get Solaire. Yeah, that would work. But, or Tommy Pham. Like, because I'm trying to think. Uh, Robert is center field, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Tommy Pham, put him in right. I th- I feel like that might be a good fit. So, but yeah. We will see. I think a lot of these guys are going to sign soon, right? We got a first spring training game starting tomorrow. Uh, And, you know, opening day will be here sooner than than later. Yeah. And for for guys, especially Kenley, like he needs to be facing some live uh, live batters here pretty darn quick if he's going to be ready for opening day. Because we don't want to see a a 20, what was it, 2019 Greg Holland. Yeah. We don't want to see that again. So, okay, well, um, we're going to be doing some interesting stuff the next few weeks with, uh, our divisional previews. We may be doing some, uh, 
some other stuff where we go more specific on teams in, in a shorter format. Um, please uh, rate, review, subscribe, all those things on YouTube and your podcast platforms. Uh, Facebook and Twitter at Getaway Day Pod. Yeah, this and been Getaway Day and. and- uh, Make sure uh, to uh, follow the Facebook and Twitter to get the updates on schedule because we, uh, I think we're going to be doing a couple of multiple podcast weeks here for the next couple weeks coming into opening day. So we'll be changing things up. So make sure to check that out. Um, we'll try and put together a schedule of some kind and post that, but we'll we'll uh, let you know on that. So. All right. We'll talk to you next time.